Hello and welcome to another new cycling season. It is 2024. It is the Australian road race and I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Harper of Team Jaco Alula. Chris, thanks for coming on. How are you? Yeah, I'm going great. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me on. So you kicked off yesterday with the time trial. You finished second, which was a, a decent result behind your teammate uh, Plap. Uh, how how was it for yep. you? Was it a, a race of pain as usual? Yeah, pretty pretty stock standard with the TT. Nothing uh, nothing to say other than it was uh, suffering from start to finish. But I think uh, great start for us. We went uh, one to four. So um, yeah, good start to the year for us. And I I've just got back from uh, watching Caleb win the uh, win the Criterium. So yeah, everything's going good. Yeah, it was it was a, a good race again. Nice to see Caleb back in the home colours. Yeah. Yeah, good to see him uh, back in the team and absolutely flying as well. He uh, he looked very fast in the finish there. Now, this time of year, we're always, especially in this side of the, the world, we're always speculating about who's in form, who's coming in with the, the target of winning the road race. You obviously, the team have strengthened. They've signed uh, current champion uh, Luke Plapp. So you come in with eight men, uh, yourself, Plapp, Caleb Ewan, Lucas Hamilton, four incredibly strong guys, Caleb Bryan, who went close a couple of years ago. So obviously the team starts with, you know, expectation of winning. How how do you think you'll go about doing that? What type of race do you think we're going to get this time? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the, the pressure of the race, I think, is always put onto us because, like you said, we do have, do have a, a strong team and you know, Plappy's won at the last two years in, in in a in a row, so he's he's also got a bit of a target on his back. But also, I think he can be confident in uh, in how he's going, given given what he did in the TT, and also um, yeah, just the confidence from winning it twice in a row. He obviously knows how how to win this bike race. Um, so I think for us, it's just you know, not a matter of who wins the bike race it's just as long as it's one of us we're going to be happy um and just always sort of being in a position that we we can win the race i think is the most important thing um it's it's easy at nationals to get caught out and then have to fix something and i think um yeah we're always always probably prefer to be on the on the front foot rather than um trying to fix things Last year, it looked to be going uh, quite well. Uh, the race seemed to be in control. And then all of a sudden, in the last, I think it was the last 2K, Platt managed to to kick on and drop uh, Michael Matthews. What do you remember of last year's race? Yeah, I think last year we probably got a little bit out of control, especially in the start of the race. We maybe didn't set ourselves up quite as well as we would have liked. And from memory, I think we, we ended up riding um for quite a bit of the race with a couple guys i think Hep, happy from memory and and rudy porter which wasn't really the plan um we we're a bit unlucky as well callum scottson was going really well but he crashed and had to change bikes so that that was one rider down sort of thing um and yeah like you said just in the final there it all sort of looked really good for bling until plappy made his move and then you know, again, uh, as soon as uh, as soon as someone's up the road, everyone sort of looks to us to fix it. And obviously, Bling being being so fast as well, he he sort of got lent on to fix Plappy and couldn't do it, and that was the race over for us. And the big news about this year, I suppose, is the potential weather. So we're used to it being roasting hot and that having a significant impact on the race, it helps to really make it selective. This year, it looks, if current forecast can be believed, we're going to get rain. It's going to be, yeah. I mean, relatively cold. It's still not cold. It's still 20, kind of 20 degrees, yeah, 24 yeah. degrees. And it's going to be a little bit windy as well. I don't remember the last time there was a rainy Australian road race. Do you? Uh, not not as wet as what they're predicting. I think a couple of years ago, I remember maybe my second year on Yumbo, it wasn't a very nice day. It was sort of overcast and drizzling a little bit. And the start of the race was actually quite cool, but um, never, never the amount of rain that they're forecasting. I think 
I just got back from the crit and someone said they're forecasting like 20 to 40 mil, which is obviously quite a bit of rain. Uh, so I definitely, definitely can never remember nationals, nationals like that. And that adds a totally different kind of element to the race. The heat usually makes it selective, but equally rain can also make a race very selective too. Do you think it's going to have like a big impact, especially if it is, you know, the 20 to 40 mil like they're talking about? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if it is that wet, then, you know, it is probably going to make a lot of guys nervous for sure. And maybe, you know, change people's tactics a little bit. Maybe some guys want to get out of the bunch and out of the mess sort of thing. I mean, obviously, um, going through on the lap, going through the Fed Uni there, there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of turning and yeah, it's maybe not the nicest or potentially could be not so nice. I remember oh, a few years back, um, you know, if a team gets on the front through the uni and actually makes it hard, you're it's it's completely strung out and it's hard out of the corners as well. So if it is wet and someone decides to make it hard through there, it's just a just an extra bit of the lap that's that's hard. Yeah, because normally it's it's usually about uh, the claim of bunny on. Uh, and then you've got mainly descending back in. You've, as you mentioned, there's a couple of tricky corners. Durbridge crashed a couple of years ago uh, on one of those ones. Yeah. In terms of the climb, obviously it's a climb everybody knows really, really well. You've got the main road section coming up and then we turn left. Now, the big news this year is that there's going to be a quite a strong headwind once you turn left. Uh, it's almost going to yeah. be block block headwind all the way to the KOM point and we're talking about depends on which weather site you use but you're you're looking at between 20 to 30 kilometers per hour which would be hugely significant and a big help for those who who don't want to attack on the climb what do you think is going to happen with the wind this year does it do you feel it a lot when you're in that section yeah quite a lot actually um I'd say the wind on this climb plays a massive impact um, especially, you know, I like to always think of the climb as having two sections. Obviously, it kicks up a bit at the start there. And then even before you turn left, you're actually getting quite a good sit on the wheel. And then you turn left, you actually uh, go downhill for a little bit. And then it's not till you take that right-hand bend where you start to start to climb up. But even then, for the next few hundred metres, it's actually quite good on the wheel. And it's just that last little kick over over Bunningyong that's actually pretty steep. So I'd say the wind plays a big impact on on this climb. Um, and we've probably seen it in the past as well from memory. Uh, one other time there was quite a solid headwind on the climb. I actually think Caleb got around quite well and he was sprinting for second, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Is that the year he lost to Housler in the sprint? Or was that another year? Yeah, might have been another year. Uh, well, it could have been that year, actually. Yeah, you might be right. But we don't often see... I mean, previous years, the wind hasn't played such a big role. Conditions have been pretty calm or it's not been a headwind. So it's been quite a long time yeah. since we've talked about, one, kind of poor conditions in terms of rain, two, a headwind. So it, it feels like almost like a totally different race compared to, to previous years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think... If it's that strong a headwind and we're all feeling it, you know, I mean, it's already, I'd say for a, a pure climber, it, it's already bloody hard to get away on that climb solo. Not many guys have been able to, to make a big difference is quite difficult. I mean, you know, we've uh, Richie Ports come here and race natural nationals and even he's not been able to get guys off, off his back wheel and, you know, uh, two weeks later, you see what the guy does to everyone at, on Wollonga Hill. It's, uh, yeah, if he can't do it, then I'm not sure who can. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I suppose the team have the ideal uh, squad with them in that there's a couple of guys who can attack if if conditions aren't as bad as this. So yourself, Plap, maybe Lucas Hamilton, and then you've got Caleb, if it comes together for any type of sprint. So you've kind of got most bases covered yeah. as a team if you're looking at your rivals obviously DSM come in with, with three riders uh, Chris Hamilton yep. and Matt Denham uh, two 
strong riders who, who have gone well here in the past. Uh, Q36.5 come in with three riders, two of whom potential kind of candidates for the win in James Whelan and Damien Housen. Michael Storer's in, but as you've mentioned, and I was going to say, really hard for a pure climber uh, to win this race. Uh, who do you think would be your biggest rivals? Yeah, I think you probably probably uh, nailed it on the head there. I think when you look it up on paper, they're probably the the two. Wow, well, they've got the numbers Q thirty six point five and uh, DSM. Um, yeah, they've obviously obviously got the numbers, and like you said, both um, both Damo and Whelan are definitely definitely capable of winning on this course, and they're normally always in good good shape this time of the year. Um, and even Cyrus, I mean, he's been the under-23 champion on this course. So, you know, things go well when everyone starts looking at each other. There's also potential to slip away. And, yeah, if everyone, I think uh, it's easy on this course to look at the profile and fixate on the on the climb. But actually in, in the last few years, sometimes, you know, the winning move's gone away or it's the race has been won typically not on the climb so it's definitely the factor that makes everyone fatigued but yeah the difference is normally made somewhere else on the course and Whelan I've been checking out his training so he since mid-October he's been doing at least 500 k's every week uh, before Christmas yep. the two weeks running up to Christmas I think he did a thousand k's both weeks before Christmas so it seems like he's interested in starting the season pretty hot. Uh, and he's got his new contract coming back to Europe. So I think most people will be looking towards uh, Whelan as the, the main sort of rival, I think, to, to your team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, he always always is, you know, someone to look out for around this course. He's uh, this time of the year, he's always in good shape. Like you said, he... He likes to put in a good bit of work over over the Christmas period, so he's always in good shape. And um, yeah, like all of us, I guess he'd enjoy being in uh, in the national champions jersey. So he's definitely definitely one to look out for. In terms of break selection, it's been a long time since the winning break has actually won. I mean, Kane Richards last year was phenomenal, surviving from that morning break and and challenging for the win. You obviously are the biggest team. You get eight riders. Is it a case of if it's a big break, we want two in it? If it's a small break, we can let it go. What What's the normal sort of kind of way the team approaches things? Certainly last year when you were riding for them. Yeah, I think I think normally if there's a big break, I think it's always good to have numbers in there. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say we want to have a big break and then you know just have one rider in there and and bank on. Um, bank on on that sort of thing um especially this year i mean probably in the past there's also been some continental teams that have had quite a lot of numbers in the elite um like a team like bridge lane has previously had good numbers in the race whereas i think this year they're they're quite a lot a young squad i think they've only maybe got three elite riders so you know there's probably not a lot of teams that are going to fix something um, if that makes sense. I can't really see anyone being too keen to uh, jump on the front and ride for ride for five laps to fix fix the break of the day or something like that. Yeah, because even before, I think we had EF and was it Draypack who used to kind of join yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. a few years ago, you had, uh, you know, I mean, they were called Avanti and they always had a big roster. Drapak always had a, uh, had a big roster and then a couple other continental teams budget forklifts and all that so there was um there was normally you know three three sort of teams outside of this team that actually had numbers um whereas this year i think like you said it's you know other than us there's q36.5 and dsm that have some numbers um but yeah no one else has got a massive squad i don't think yeah and i think the key thing for both those teams is they've only got three but yeah, two, two guys are probably co-leaders at, at least for the first half of the race. So really, they've only got yeah. one to each. So yeah, the it goes away. It's it's just really hard to ride as a one rider and bring things back. 
yeah for sure and like uh, yeah i guess as well you know even if you do have numbers it's you know do you really want to uh get on the front and give give everyone else a free ride sort of in the race as well it's um i think that's what makes nationals quite tricky sometimes <laughs> and we've seen before like the team aren't shy and chasing down the break even if it contains riders I mean, it's it's a race. I suppose you've got to be really honest about your legs, and if you are up front, you've got to be honest and say, "I'm not winning today." And then the boys from behind can start chasing. And it always, it never ceases to amaze me how fast the gap can tumble. Uh, on yeah. a, I mean, we've seen before, kind of six minutes disappear, and yeah. what seems like one lap, it's it's almost insane that the difference that a chasing pun uh, chasing bunch can make. Yeah, for sure. I think if you if you sort of explode on this course, it's uh, you're pretty quickly <laughs> going backwards. You lose lose time so fast. Um, so yeah, it, I mean the team team's never been afraid of taking it up and you know bringing something back or sending guys across. So I think um, yeah, if you've got the numbers and you got strong guys that can do it, then then it always helps. And I suppose the only one I've not really mentioned is Simon Clark, who was second last year. Uh, it might be his last season in the pro ranks. I don't, he's not said anything yet. Uh, another rider who, oh, unfortunately for him, he's a solo rider, but very, very high quality rider. Yeah, for sure. And and like you said at the start of the conversation, it's you know no one's really seen anyone race uh, this time of the year, so. We've all got a question mark of who's going well and who's not going well. So um, definitely, it's a course that suits him quite well. I'd say so. If he if he is in shape, then he'll be definitely be one to watch out for. And I suppose we over this side of the world, we often have a little list of riders who go well in the rain. Uh, I don't yeah. normally have too many Australians on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing I'm not on that list. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll see. I mean, as we said, the, the forecasters are predicting a storm. These things can be very hard to to actually get right. So it could end up just being showers and a little yeah. bit of wind, and therefore it won't be as selective as maybe it could be if the heavens open. It's going to be a bloodbath, I would imagine. Uh, right, moving yeah. on from the the road race, let's look back at your season, twenty twenty three. I for me, I don't know about you personally. For me, I think your best season in the pro ranks, uh, riding extremely well for Simon Yates in a lot of big races. So, you know, I've been looking back. Paris Nice, you were right up there riding for Simon incredibly well. Tour de France is the one that sticks out for me the most. You were there riding as domestic when most other teams didn't have anybody left, which must have been really pleasing for yourself. And then rounding it off in Lombardia, uh, What's that claim called? Ganda. When Roglic had been dropped, you're on the front nailing it again for Simon, pushing the pace on. How did you feel last season was for you? Yeah, really good, actually. I really, I mean, for the most part, I enjoyed the season. I had a bit of a rocky start to the year. I'm breaking my collarbone at Down Under, so I missed a bit of racing in Australia. Um, and then I sort of started to get a bit of momentum at Paris Nice. And then last day, uh, didn't feel my best and the next day tested positive for COVID. So um, <laughs> that that threw a bit of a spanner in the works. And after that, I actually had a bit of a rough couple months where I just sort of kept getting crook a bit. Uh, so that was tough and then got on top of that and I had a good good lead into the Tour de France, had a good hard race at the Dauphiné and then sort of everything clicked and didn't have uh, too much trouble going into the Tour and yeah, I was pretty lucky the whole race in terms of crashes and all that. And yeah, I think I'm quite happy with my performance. And I think team, from what I gather, is uh, happy with how it went as well. So yeah, the tour was great. I think it's one of those ones every bike rider wants to do. So it was nice to, um, yeah, nice to make it to the finish. And also, yeah, I feel like I at some points had had an impact on the race. Um, well, I hope anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, the finish of the year I was happy with as well. Like I've never really considered myself being very good at one-day races, but 
I think I found a, a good balance of going into one day races and, um, and yeah, I was happy with how I finished my season there at Lombardia. I think, I think I um, had another another pretty decent ride there. So as a whole, I think I think it's been a well. I think last season was pretty good. Yeah. So it was your first Tour de France. Obviously, you're you're not a junior anymore. So it's taken a while to reach that level. Yeah. Was it everything you thought it was going to be? Yeah, I think I think so. Like it's yeah, it's the tour. So I think the most noticeable thing is just the difference in media and how many fans are at the start and finish. Um, one thing I was surprised about is sort of when you're on the climbs and you're actually doing it, you sometimes don't realise how busy it is. And then if you go back and watch the highlights or something, you're like, oh, there's uh, – I think I went back and watched the day that we went through um, through – Thibaut Pinot's region and I was watching the climb there and I was like I don't remember any of this I mean I was suffering in the box uh, up that climb so it probably makes sense that I don't remember but I remember looking on TV and being like this is incredible there's so many people out so yeah I definitely um, definitely lived up to the height I absolutely hated the Champs-Élysées made me never want to do a cobbled classic <laughs> so um, <laughs> so yeah once once I got to the finish and that out the way, it was it was awesome. And this year, a relatively similar route, I would imagine. You you've got nationals, you've got tour down under. I've had a little look at the route, so no corkscrew this year. Wollonga's back, and they've kept the the Mount Lofty stage as well. You your team's arriving with Simon Yates, who was very close last year, uh, and potentially could be the first non Southern Hemisphere winner since a long time ago. Uh, what do you think of the route this year with no court screw and keeping the the lofty stage? Yeah, I think it's uh I think in terms of how down under is it's it's probably pretty similar um in terms of the overall like what sort of rider can win it. You could have a rider who's going to get up well under and not lose too much time but can also take bonus seconds throughout the race. Um, like I'm thinking back to, you know, when Daryl Impey was winning it, um, taking bonus seconds and limiting his losses on on Wollonga Hill. But at the same time, I think, I think with Wollonga there, obviously, it's a climb that is good for Simon. Um, and also we've seen what Richie can do to people on Wollonga. It's probably another another climb like Nationals where the wind does have a big impact if it's. If it's the wrong wind up there, it can be pretty frustrating. Um, and also, I think it, I think it opens up the race a bit having the the lofty stage the last day as well, especially coming off Wollonga the day before. Um, just see how people's legs are, and obviously, it's a tough finish up to Mount Lofty, and it could be. Um, yeah, you could be fighting out the GC in the bonus seconds for the sprint up Lofty, I guess. And then is it off to UAE, UAE tour after that, or is it something different this year? No, I'll um I'll stick around in Australia for a week, and I'll do Cadells the following weekend, and then I'll head back to Europe. And um, and yeah, my first race back there will be Paris Nice. And definitely no cobbled classics. Definitely no cobbled classics. <laughs> Well, Chris, I hope you enjoy uh, Sunday's race. I hope it doesn't rain too much uh, for you and your, your fellow Australians over there. Uh, <laughs> best of luck for the race and best of luck for the season ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.